Hello, hello. Welcome to Testimony Tuesday. I am your host, Minister Myra Howard. I am the founder and president of Diamond in the Rough Ministries in San Antonio. This month, our focus is mental health awareness. And tonight we will be talking about mental health effects in the African-American and our Black community. Statistics state that there has been a rise in mental health, in mental illness in the Black community. Major depressive disorders are up, suicide rate is up, and so is substance abuse. Tonight, we're going to talk about it. I have a triple treat for you. We have a powerful trio that is going to break it down for us. They will be addressing the entire being, the mind, body, and spirit. All three of them were born and raised in Louisiana. All three are highly educated in their respective fields. And all three are drop dead gorgeous. First, we have our counselor, Lepetria Davis Jordan for the mind. She is a veteran. She is a counselor with many specialties. Her heart's work is working with adolescents, teens, and young adults. Next, we have Dr. P.D. Davis Jenkins for the body. She is a board certified family medicine physician. She has served as a flight surgeon in the Air Force and her special interests include preventative and education. And then we have Minister Ty Jackson to cover our spiritual side. She is an answer, writer, producer, entrepreneur, and a powerful person. So we, after I have introduced them, I'm going to, uh, we're going to get ready and uh, we don't have a long um, so our, we're going to start, I'm going to ask you the first question that we're going to I think that we have to ask you, um, call us our Facebook, and I think that'll start. Okay. 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 So my first question is, we're going to start off with Dr. Petey. Uh, and we and I want each one to address the question. Uh, Dr. Peter, how would you say that mental health has affected the black community? So we speak specifically in the past year with the pandemic or just in general? Uh, mental health in general. OK, so um, the biggest thing with the black community is that although mental health clearly impacts us the same as it impacts most other demographics, it is a very taboo topic in the black community. And we are not as open to um, labels or diagnosis or treatment, um, therapy, any of the above. Um, from a general perspective, um, we have, as we all know, been a very oppressed people. So we have been you know, impact it from a health perspective, from a financial perspective, from a racial perspective, um, from, you know, multiple um, angles that um, although we aren't always open about it, um, it clearly has a significant impact on us, um, not only as a community, but individually, and we address it, you know, in different ways. Um, some of that is um, by, you know, not addressing it, but some is through uh, chemical dependence, um, you know, whatever type of um, recreational drug, um, but whatever kind of allows the mind to escape from that um, depression, but to not truly address it and 
Thank you. All right. Thank you. So in the last year, have you been seeing an increase, Dr. Peter? Uh, in mental health crisis, absolutely. Um, definitely during the pandemic. And I think the biggest piece for me is that I'm seeing more people actually self-identify and actually come and seek help um, than we would previously. Um, there are more people who are uh, who are recognizing um, that they actually need um, professional help. So, so how do you determine if they need professional help? Um, if they come to me, in my opinion, they need professional help. Um, so because at the end of the day, I am a professional. So um, it for me, it kind of depends on, and, and I'm going to be honest, um, for me, I feel like almost everybody needs counseling or some form of um, psychology, or psychiatric help. Um, I, I do more of the medication side of it, but I'm going to be honest, I feel like medication helps you cope to a certain extent. It's a coping mechanism, but it's not necessarily a healing mechanism. And I think to truly um, heal, you have to seek counseling or spiritual guidance, whatever. Um, my piece is more of a piece to help educate you and understand the problem and direct you to getting the help you need. And like I said, give you medication to cope. But at the end of the day, the, the medication is just that. It's a way to kind of mellow and cope. But if you're depressed because of whatever personal situation until you deal with that, you, you know, you really won't solve the problem. Right, right. So after you, oh, I'm sorry. So after you um, see a, a patient and you determine that they might need um, help from a, um, a mental health professional, how, do you, how, how does that process work? Um, uh, for me, it's pretty simple. Um, I have a discussion with them. I encourage them to speak, you know, a, a counselor, a therapist. And the good thing is there's so many angles now. There um, are people who work virtually. Um, so it, it, there's a lot of access. Well, there is not a lot of access, but there are a lot of different avenues to, to seek a therapist. Um, so I try to have a conversation with them about educating and for me, I always try to make patients understand that mental health is no different from having diabetes or high blood pressure um, or migraine or whatever. The same way you would seek medical help for that is the same way you seek it for your mental health. And I try to explain to them that, you know, the best treatment overall is to have that um, counseling um, aspect of it. Um, and I'm gonna be honest. I'm not 50. Um, about 50 percent of patients aren't interested in it, and they won't. They just want medication. But about 50 percent of them are willing to you know, see the counselor. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I was I was asking about the process because I was talking to someone, and her primary care had um, given her. Uh, a prescription for anxiety, depression. And so then I asked, have you been talking to anyone? Do you have a therapist? And she had no idea how to go about it. So I was able to give her a little direction and how to have her primary care uh, put in a referral for her to see someone, to be able to speak to someone. So in the, when they go to the next step to speak to someone, um, Lepetria, so how, how do you feel that it's affecting the um, Black community from your perspective? Well, first of all, I would like to say that mental health um, don't really discriminate against nobody. That's right. Um, it basically affects the rich and the poor. It affects the, um, um, it affects all ethnic groups. Um, basically, it's also a mistrust 
um, with the doctors and uh, the health professionals. Um, Black, um, well, I'm gonna say African-American um, Americans, they feel more comfortable with people that looks like them. Um, and that's because of history of us being misdiagnosed. Um, you know, our children in the past have, you know, been diagnosed as mentally retarded. And, um, you know, when they didn't, when the site, when the IQ test um, was meant for the white household, um, you know, basically that, you know, one of the questions on the IQ test years ago was because they had the cup and a saucer test um, um, questionnaire. And basically one of the questions was to white, you know, to everybody was what you put that cup on. And white Americans, children would say um, that they put the cup on the saucer. But in black and brown households, they were poor. You know, they didn't have their table set like the white household. Some of them didn't have that saucer to put that cup on. They was putting it on the table. So when they asked the question, the kid would say, I put the cup on um, the table. And that question was wrong when it was actually right. Um, for, for that, that question. Um, so a lot of times the psychologists didn't understand our community. And, you know, black people still feel like a lot of them don't understand our community. And we do have a shortage of African-Americans in the, um, in the prof um, health profession and, um, and as doctors. Um, also, I feel like um, we lack health insurance. And so with that, we, our people um, lack getting uh, the medication they need from their psychiatrist. And so we have people that go, go to drugs and that's a coping mechanism. Um, we, a lot of, a lot of clients, um, basically use, you know, some of my clients use weed as a coping me mechanism because they don't have the insurance. Um, it's also a stigma in our community. As we know in the past, um, African Americans didn't want that stigma of having a mental illness because they so say was considered crazy, um, mm -hmm. you know, and of course in, in our black churches, they wanted to pray a, a mental health, health away or the problem away. Instead of sending people, you know, it's okay to seek spiritual counseling, but sometimes a problem is way worse, you know, than just spiritual counseling and pray, praying. You need a health professional. And that's where our community lacked, um, the church lacked in, you know, giving advice to, to seek a health professional. So. All right. So I, I one of the things that I noticed you were talking about is some of the differences that we have. And I was thinking uh, we have a lot of um, in our history, we have some some differences, especially in the social socioeconomic area. Um, mm -hmm. has caused a difference in the medical care that we receive, the health care, well, the the health. Um, many times people were not able to seek uh, mental health professionals. So right. along with the stigma, there is also the disadvantage. Uh, and right. We have a long history. I call it the residue of slavery because we've had the slavery. We have all those things that went down from generation to generation that has gotten us to where we are now, which will include, uh, include the single parent homes 
the poverty level um, and many things that happen in our communities that many people have not talked about. Um, so that's why I thought it was really, really important that we bring out that mental health awareness because we need people to know that it is okay to not be okay. Um, right. But today is not okay to stay not okay. So right. um, we are thankful for you and, and Dr. Petey. And so we're going to bring Minister Tay on on the the ministry side, on the spiritual side. So how has the um, mental health affected the church, the black church? And I'm sorry. We can't hear her. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, there is definitely a mental health epidemic in the African American community. Um, unfortunately, a lot of African Americans do not have access to certain health care benefits and things of that nature to have it addressed properly. In the church, um, oftentimes, you know, we see mental issues as demons. You know, we feel the demon, we need to pray it out. But I believe God has given us wisdom and there is spiritual health and there is the natural health or the medical health that needs to come together to help those of us that are in the black community that are dealing with mental health issues. When we talk about mental health issues, we're not talking about just an extreme. We're talking about depression. We're talking about grief. We're talking about things that we deal with on a daily basis. When a loved one is lost, that is an issue that the church has to deal with. We can go to the car, we can quote the scriptures, we can pray. And, and a lot of times that's enough to help people cross over and get to their place of, of balance, get to a place where they feel whole and complete again. But then sometimes it goes deeper than that. Sometimes people are needing an additional assistance outside of what they can get at the church. And that's when it's our job to seek professional help for them as well. We continue to stand on the wall and pray. We continue to cover them in prayer. But just like when there is a medical issue, just like when there's a medical issue um, in, in the church, we also send our parishioners to the, to the physicians so that they can get help. So we'll go ahead and, and, and you know, advocate for them to get some therapy. And this is where I think we can have professionals partnering with the local church so that when someone is in need of having additional help outside of the spiritual side, they can then transition over to that professional that has the credentials to help them get more mental clarity because that is what we're missing. Um, in the black community, oftentimes we can discredit somebody and just say, oh, they're crazy, but it's not. It's attention that is needed um, oftentimes, yeah, it's spiritual, but then also it can go beyond that and become a physical ailment, a mental ailment to the individual. All right. We had a, a question for, for, from David S. Dobb. It was the same for poor white people who could not afford sauce. Each person had one cup, and if you were lucky, or you shared a cup with a sibling. Amen. Poverty, poverty does not discriminate at all. At all. And so, amen, David. You're right. You're right. And, and just and just so this this month. We have um, addressed mm -hmm. different populations. We've addressed our veterans. We've we've addressed all different sects. And so this last one for Dr. PD and uh, Petria, they kind of tag team. We decided to do this. Uh, mental health in the African American communities because we do know that a lot of times people. Um, especially in the African-American community um, are not open to receiving the help, are not open to going to get that help because they don't want to be thought of as 
as crazy or or anything like that. So we do want to normalize that it's it's really okay. And thank you for thank you for all the feedback, David. I see you. Thank you. And um, just the uh, tag team back off of uh, Minister Ty. I wholeheartedly agree. That's one reason why I am doing it. I am a minister. I've been favored a long time. But I also know the importance of having to get out of the church. Um, yes, 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 I believe in Jesus. I believe in the But at the end of the day, I understand that we sometimes need to call in a specialized in that area of mental health because it might be too much for a pastor that may not be completely equipped to do it, um, or the church may not have the resources to have someone to help them. So we do want to um, just put it out there and, and encourage. Um, Say so we encourage our viewer to comment when you are viewing from, oh, where you're viewing from, hey amen. Put it in the chat box. Where are we hearing from you from? Drop it, drop where, you, where you're at. Because yes, I'm, I'm, I'm from San Antonio and we're from all over. So drop it in the box and say hi to us. All right. Jacqueline Morgan from Louisiana. Hallelujah. All right. Well, we're going to get ready to, um, I believe we're going to need to take a little break or we're going to go on to our next question. All right, well, we're going to go on into our next question. And this is a good one. This is a good one for me. How would you say police brutality has affected the mental health in the black community? And these are opinions. So we'll start with Dr. Davis Jenkins. How would you say? Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think the biggest thing is understanding understanding the correlation between trauma and mental health. Um, I think we're all familiar with um, post traumatic stress disorder, um, you know, anxiety, depression, all of those things. But um, a a huge piece of the police brutality is the trauma that it has caused to the black community. Um, not only um, is there fear, um, but it's in your face. We see it. Um, it it's, you know, I, I didn't grow up, you know, in the 50s or whenever, but it's, you know, or prior decades where it may have been more hidden, but now due to social media and so forth, like it is in your face. And I think for most of us, there is a very, um, realization of the fact that that could be you, that could be your son, that could be your daughter, that could be your brother, that could be your sister. And so even though, um, and I know Minister Ty could speak on this, as we know, whatever your faith is, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but it takes, um, you know, you really, really have to get to a place mentally where you're able to deal with the reality of our America, um, the reality of your skin color, the reality that that's not going to change and decide how you don't live in fear, you know, but you still try to perform and be on a day to day basis, knowing that when you leave your home, I went for a bike ride today and I live in a predominantly white community. And although I haven't, thank God, personally had any issues, there was that kind of thought in the back of my head as I was going down this one road, like, you know, what if someone thinks, you know, I don't belong here? And so that is very much a realization. And if um, even for someone who is already mentally stable, like, let's say you really don't have any 
you know, past mental history or concerns, it is still um, a stressor that you're dealing with every day. But if you take someone who already has a, a level of instability in their mental health, and now you drop this trauma stressor that they really can't do anything about because it's it's on you because of who you are. It's on you because of the color of your skin. You can't control if, you know, a police decides to do a random traffic check. Um, you can't control if they decide to ride behind you and run your license plate. Um, like I said, I was riding a bike. I can't control if you know, someone decides, you know, to approach me about something random. Do you belong here? Whatever it may be. So it's it's a realization of our America. Um, and it definitely has, um, you know, increased trauma, stress, which has increased um, mental health concerns. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more, but we're going to take a quick break. Y'all stay with us and we encourage y'all to drop questions in the in the box when we come back. So if we have time, we will address them. So we're going to be right back in just a few. Each case is totally different. I can't give you an exact time frame of how long it will take your case, but I can explain how long it takes based on phases. The first phase is your treatment phase. I don't know how long it takes you to get well, but that's the first phase. The second phase is a phase where we're gathering medical records, medical bills and everything and sending it to the insurance company for processing. The third phase deals with negotiations. Sometimes that's short, sometimes that's long. Negotiations break down, we're into the trial process. If you file your case in the general district court, you'll probably have a hearing in about four or five months. Those cases cannot get any more than $25,000. If you file your case in the circuit court, the sky's the limit. You can ask for any amount you want. It will take between eight to 10 months to get a verdict. Understand that at any point through this process, your case can settle. There's still settlement negotiations going on even though the court process is working. So if the case settles, the court process is over. The most important part is for the client to treat with his or her doctor and get well. We will take care of everything else. Dr. Davis Jenkins. So we're going to piggyback off of what you said. And so my next question for Lapetria is um, Dr. Dr. Petey mentioned stressors. So with, with a lot of us having those stressors, uh, she was uh, riding her bike and we're walking. If we get stopped, so can you from a counselor's perspective, what are good ways that we can handle that? What are good things that we can do to handle that if we're in that situation? <laughs> um, we have, um, throughout history, um, dealt with this problem of police brutality. Um, you know, we we know that a lot of our people have um, have been killed and and got away with it. Um, so basically, how would I again, P, um, Dr. Davis basically mentioned that um, that they suffer from PTSD. So a lot of a lot of people that is is exposed. Um, to this, even, you know, hopefully they, you know, they can get out of it. But a lot of times if they see um, someone get murdered, um, they definitely possibly, you know, would have PTSD. Um, 
And of course, they would come to counseling. Um, but overall, you know, our community is on edge. <laughs> the entire, you know, it's a lot of blacks in the community is on edge. Um, from what we have visually saw, um, basically on social media, cell phones, you know, years ago, you know, the whole town came <laughs> and saw black people being hanged from a tree and, you know, everybody, nobody was convicted of a crime. Now we see that social media, it's on social media and, and cell phones, um, and basically everybody see, <laughs> and we have police getting away with murder. Um, luckily with George Floyd case, that was different. You know, that brought, brought us a little hope, but still black people is on edge, even with the simple thing of a traffic stop. You know, they don't know if a little simple thing can be deadly. You know, um, it can go from traffic stop to domestic violence to um, basically being called out for a mentally ill person. Um, we've seen people get killed for, for these simple, innocent black people being killed, for these simple, innocent, simple things. Um, so are we, are we on, are our people on edge? Yes. Yes. Um, oh, I, as a counselor, basically I'm helping them through the process. <laughs> I'm helping them through the process. Um, what they see visually, <laughs> um, still puts them on edge because they, they, into this George Floyd thing, they wasn't seeing visually hope. They wasn't visually seeing that, you know? Um, so, I mean, all, all the council can help them do is get through and help them cope with what they have seen. Help them to cope throughout life for what they have seen. We can help them cope and develop a relationship with them so they can live a productive life with this illness. Mm -hmm. But as we know too, other than George Floyd, we had a case recently just came out on seat, you know, it was all throughout the news of um, a man by the name of Ron Green. And um, the state police, um, where well, this happened in Monroe, Louisiana, and the state police basically supposedly was doing um, a traffic stop for um, Mr. Green. And um, they said that basically what a traffic stop, they supposedly it ended up in a chase. That's what supposedly had happened in their police report. But we end up finding out. And a police report also said that he uh, crashed into a tree. Um, the autopsy that was done basically questioned what the police had wrote in, in that statement. Um, two years, well, it was actually a lady that stayed across the street that basically had a video. And she seen Mr. Green getting out the car. But that's not what the police said. They said he died instantly in the car crash. So that's what started the family to investigate, want an investigation. And the case was open. Now we find out two years later well, that Mr. Green was murdered. Mm -hmm. Murdered by state troopers. We even have a state trooper that basically was laughing at the fact of him beating Mr. Green to death. So the police department had hidden that. The, the, the video was released without permission. Someone in, in the department released the video to the, the news station. Mm -hmm. And we basically, this is what we had to have to deal with throughout history, you know? And Mr. Green, this situation wouldn't have came out if somebody didn't get that videotape and put it out in the public. 
Right. 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 So I'm going to we're going to speak with Minister Ty. Um, Dr. Petey had mentioned that God does not give us the spirit of fear. I would like to hear from you on how that will work, how, how that works in this case uh, as a Christian. And then we're going to have our last question. And that last question is, do you think black men suffer more mental health issues than others because of what they go through? Right. So Minister Todd. I'm going to address the, um, as Petey said, God has not given us a spirit of fear. One of my favorite scriptures comes from Philippians 4 and 6. And it tells us to be anxious or to be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, we make our requests known unto God. Oftentimes, um, especially as a believer, this is my stance. This is the thing that helps to keep me grounded. And whenever I allow myself to get out of that, whenever I allow myself to, to get anxious and try and do things for myself, then that's when I get off kilt. That's when depression can set in. That's when anxiety can set in. That's when these different things can set in. But as a believer, if we truly, truly um, hold on to that word and we say, Lord, calm my spirit. You know, the Bible talks about letting this mind be in me that was also in Christ Jesus. Lord, renew my mind. Renew my heart, renew a right spirit within me so that I can be able to cope with today's society. As a black woman, I am extremely conscious of my surroundings. Um, whether you are a male or a female, a traffic stop can become tragic. I can't lie and tell you that I don't feel anxiety. I see a cop car coming behind me and I know I haven't done anything. My my um, license and registration and everything else is intact. However, the fear of being um, targeted just simply for the, the color of my skin, I can't lie and say that that's not there. Uh, we've seen it happen time and time again. But the only thing that sustains me and keep me on kilts and keep me balanced is I have trust in God. I trust that he's going to keep me. I trust that he's going to watch over me. I trust that he's going to guide me, that he's my shield and my buckler, that he's my protector and he's my defense. And the one thing that I can tell people, especially if you think about in every days, if you think about, you know, in times of old and the civil rights movement, what was the thing that kept us together? It was our faith in God. I'm sure that there were many, 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 many um health issues, uh, mental health issues then. But I believe through prayers and supplication, I believe through trusting in God, I believe through all of these things that we maintain a consistency to prevail through it all. Don't you think that even those days, even though we're seeing um, ourselves being killed and things of that nature, how much more was it done in the time of slavery that Black people still stood? How much more were Black people hunted, hung, and all kinds of things, but they were still strong. They still had strong families. They still maintained their minds, and we've risen to a place. Hope is not lost. Hope Amen. is not lost. We Amen. just need together, recognize the power that is within us, which is in Jesus Christ, and come together and partner with our professionals to get people to help their baby. Amen. 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 All right. So Amen. we we did have a comment in the the chat and that, that question is do black men suffer more from mental health issues due to stress? Give me your, your opinion. Uh, we'll start with Lepetria. What do you think? I kind of, and this based on my opinion, um, I basically, basically think yes. Right. I think yes. Um, we see more of our men um, suffer from police brutality, suffer from loss of jobs, where they can't take care of their family. And um, 
I think, you know, now they feel like, um, cause now the women are getting these high paying salary jobs while our black men have a hard time finding jobs because of felonies that they got as a young boy, you know, a teen or even a young adult, you know, and they have to live with those felonies for the rest of their life. Um, you know, they have a lot of people that um, that truly discriminate against them. Um, and so, and, and then we met, we, as black mothers worry about our black sons, um, you know, with the issue of, of being stopped by the police. So I think black men are always, um, they always are, they are always on edge. Uh, and that's my opinion. That's my opinion. Black men are always on edge. And they, I think throughout history, black men has always been on edge and, and mistreated, I believe, more than the black females. I believe okay. that's based on my opinion. Yes, ma'am. So Dr. Peter, what do you say? I, I would agree mostly with um, Lapetria. I, I I do have a, a slightly different of opinion. Um, so in general, yes, my answer is yes. I, I definitely feel like um, black males deal more um, with mental health and stress. And once again, as I spoke earlier, go undiagnosed and um, unidentified um, from a, a diagnosis perspective. Um, the reason I feel I agree with Lapetria um, men are expected to be providers. Uh, men are expected to um, be the head of their household. Men are expected to lead. Um, and um, society has definitely pushed um, in, in, in movements over the past few years, definitely been a push for women. And a lot of times, um, particularly black women, um, you know, kind of check two boxes, you know, you check the minority as well as the female. And so yes, sometimes I, I feel like black women are, you know, chosen per se in certain um, areas because it does, you know, kind of feel to um, minority deficits per se for a company. And I think um, as women have become more breadwinners in the home, um, more of the financial leaders, I, you know, I definitely feel like um, they're, you know, men naturally have, you know, pride and take pride in being able to provide. And when, you know, a man doesn't quote unquote have a, a good job or, you know, whatever that means by society, because, you know, sometimes that's not being the sanitation worker by whoever standards. And so men, there's this stress to, to be able to, um, you know, buy your, you know, wife or, you know, female friend, you know, these nice things and make them feel special. But at the same time, you know, make all of these big, you know, financial moves and decisions for the family, but they may or may not lack, you know, the income or resources or whatever, not to mention the um, trauma from, you know, police brutality and racism and the fact that just for, you know, my husband is a, um, you know, a, a browner skinned gentle, um, gentleman and, you know, in the community we live in, I can honestly say I've never really dealt with anything, but he's told me like he's gone in places and when he walks in, everyone kind of looks and stares, you know, just because he is a black male. And so that's a real um, truth for us uh, or for men to have to deal with. My only um, slight um, difference of opinion, I do feel like black women come in a close, close, close second. Um, and the only reason why I say that is because of, of what I just mentioned. Women are becoming more of breadwinners and you know, kind of leaving, leading the home financially, but our workload does not change. You know, when we become the breadwinner, it's not like the man now becomes um, the domestic engineer. 
You know, when a man is the, the breadwinner or provider, a woman is happy to be the homemaker, happy. You know, men, that's not a place of comfort for them. So it's a role that's very hard for them to take on. So, I, and I say this, you know, one, because I live it, but two, because I see it. I have so many women coming in on a regular basis at their wit's end because they are trying to do it all. They are working. They are trying mm -hmm. to maintain being the, the, the breadwinner in their households. They are trying to still be mothers and make sure their children are well-educated, make sure their children are well-disciplined. They're still carrying all of these things in addition. So the target may not be as big on their back, but because of the way society has kind of shifted our black males and we've had to step up in our household, I think sometimes the, it is hard for a black male to support a black woman the way a black woman would be able to support a black male in that role. Can we get an amen, 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 amen. So I think it's, you know, I'm amen. not by any means trying to skew, you know, the black male, cause I do, I, I definitely feel like um, they, they deal with a lot of stress and mental health issues from that angle. But but black women are a close second, a close second, because I, I see this daily. Women that literally are just stretched thinner than they can be stretched, trying to maintain both roles. All right. All right. So what do you say about it, Minister Tang? My um opinion is that absolutely I believe that men are underdiagnosed, I will say that. Our men don't get the help that they need because oftentimes of pride or lack of resources, they don't go and seek the medical attention that is needed for mental health. However, I do not believe that they're more stressed than black women. Um, I look at sisters every day that are carrying the load of being a mother and a father. So many of our households are single households because we have sisters that have had to, they have to go and work. They have to raise the children. They have to do everything. They got to maintain the household. So many times I see sisters that are laying it all on the line just for a man to love them. That's a whole nother subject just to get somebody to choose them, just to have somebody to say, that's my husband. And you find us fighting in the streets over trying to have a man who's probably, it's, we can go deep here, trying to have somebody, trying to fight for a love that's not choosing them. I believe honestly, and I'm just going to be honest. I think that the black woman is one of the most unprotected individuals. Come on. But the she is so That's unprotected. She is broken. She is hurting. She is crying. And she's always the last one chosen in so many instances. Now, I'm not saying all that. I'm not saying all brothers. We got some amazing brothers in this world. We got some amazing men, whether they're black, white, whatever. Love to me has no color. But when I talk about the black woman, I've seen her in my life. I've been her in my life where you're trying to carry so many loads. You're trying to survive and you're trying to compensate. You, you can't be too smart because now mm -mm, um, you think you all that. So because I'm a highly educated and a high earner now, I'm, I'm, I'm too much, I'm too high-minded for my black man. There's a man that talks on the TV now that says a woman who makes 100K plus is not worthy of another man that makes 100K plus because of the maybe the way she looks. And, this, and I, I, I'm tired of that. You mean to tell me that if I bust my behind and I make just as much money as you and I bring just as much peace to the table and I bring just as much anointing and, and prayer and everything else to make your home, I'm not enough? No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. I see too many women that are stressed. They they raising kids. And sad to say, many women, because they go, people talk about our women, they, oh, she got three baby daddies. Okay, let's look at that situation, though. The first baby daddy, she probably thought that, that was going to be her husband. And she Come on, was a woman at the well. Then what happened? That man turned around and left her with a baby. So another man comes. She give herself to him. Like That's why I tell women, stop giving these men wife 
privileges, husband privileges, and that's not your husband. Because until he puts a ring on your finger, baby, let him do what he do and you do what you do. Build up yourself. Build up your wealth. Build up your peace. Build yourself up so that a real man, a Boaz, will find you. Two I see our women, they stressing, they dying. Yes, our brothers are lacking. They are underserved. They are under, you know, supported, I think, in a lot of ways. But let me take one more point. In my professional business, in my professional business, I am a interior construction engineer. I deal with going on to a project, owning that project, managing it, getting subcontractors to come under me. Do you know the pressure that I go under? Because when people see me, they see a woman and they, they will talk to the guy that's there to put up the drywall quicker than they will talk to me. And I'm the one that owns the project. I'm the one that's cutting the checks. But because I'm a black woman, they look at like, talking over my head, baby, You, the buck gonna stop with me. Whether you like my color, whether you like my gender or not, I'm the one that's writing the check. So you may as well come and talk to me. Too many times you see sisters, we gotta do more and more. We are a double minority. We are a double minority. We're African-American and we are female. That is a lot of pressure, so much pressure. And at the same time, I'm not negating my brothers. My brothers are being discriminated, but let's not even get into the, the molestation and the rape that we go through as women. Look at what's happening. Go ahead there, sister. What can we do? Yo, you are less of sex. You got a big man coming over you, whether he's white, black, or whatever. He's coming at you, and you it's your word against his. It is your word against his. So I do feel for my brothers, Lord knows, anybody that knows me know I advocate for my brothers, but my God, somebody got to pick up the black sister that's not a black sister. Come on. Can Amen. we get somebody to Amen. come to us that's not one of us? Amen. It's enough. Amen. Oh, I Amen. feel like All right. Well, I concur. I'm going to. Amen. Amen. I mean, and that. Sister said it all. Amen. I just that's about all I can say is I mean I do agree. Black men are, are stressed. Yeah. They have it hard. They have it rough. But I really don't think that anyone has ever had it as hard as a black woman. And we're that we're that seed. They they couldn't kill us, so we just keep growing and growing. But we've been through some stuff, uh, and we continue to go through some stuff. Um, and yeah, we're going we're going to keep going. Wow. Um because here's the here's the last question that I have for the panel. Um So the CDC has most recently stated that if you're fully vaccinated, you can resume activities that you did prior to the pandemic without a mask or social distancing. What type of mental impact do you think this change will have on our community? We could start with Minister Ty, with the change. Um, with the change, you know, our community was really hit hard with the pandemic. Um, but a lot of not just black people, but people in general were not complying to the mask order anyway, or the social distancing order. We had people having parties and all kinds of stuff. So mentally, I think basically at this point and what I'm seeing around the world, people are going to do what they want to do. Um, I'm hoping that people will definitely continue to be safe so that we can reopen because it is a known fact that if the world catches a cold, we gonna get the flu. So it's very important that we do our due diligence and stay safe mentally. I think with the CDC saying that it's okay for us not to wear the mask and things of that nature, people who've been affected by it, they're going to be mentally stressed and strained by that because they're going to feel like it's too soon. 
But again, you know, I think this is a time and a place where people are going to really kind of make a decision to do what's best for them. All right. And Dr. Petey? I, I agree somewhat with um, Minister Ty. I think it honestly just depends. Um, I think you're going to have a little bit of both. I'm going to be honest. Um, I, I think what we don't recognize is that, um, and I'm, this is not my opinion, this is just facts of, of the, the different pockets of people. Um, there are people who have been so isolated um, and that isolation has caused such depression for them that this is good news. Like there are people who are single and who um, their livelihood was through being able to interact and just just have normal life, you know, um, and this past year has been, you know, so um, depressing in general um, that for them, you know, this may be good news. Um, now, I totally try to educate my patients um, to use, I know common sense is not that common, but to exercise some common sense in terms of, you know, even if you're going to leave out, still maintaining your social distance. Um, if you're, you are in an unfamiliar environment, still wearing a mask. Um, but the reality is that for some people like this is, um, uplifting and exhilarating, um, guidelines from the CDC. Now, the flip side of that coin is you have people who have chronic illnesses. Um, you have people who are literally scared and afraid. And um, the fact that they know that this guideline is now going to be a pass for some people to just, you know, go all in and, you know, forget, you know, that we are still in a pandemic. We are. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. And to just be wide open there are people who this is now going to drive more fear because they were just starting to feel more comfortable with kind of moving around. You know, the mask get, gave them a level of protection. Like there are some people that the mask isolated in the social and there are other people that it gave them a level of protection. And now that's being taken away. Mm -hmm. So now when they did feel comfortable going in the grocery store, now they don't because mm -hmm. now everybody's wide open. So you're going to mm -hmm. have both. And I think that's just going to be the situation with this pandemic period. And I think, um, like I always tell my patients, you have to um, weigh your own individual risk um, and, you know, just try to make the best decision, you know, for you, your family, whomever. Um, when, you know, this past weekend, LaPetri and I, our family got together for my niece's graduation. Um, and I can honestly say it just felt so good to to be back in, you know, an environment with family and to give hugs and yeah. to have conversations. And, you know, that's a level of healing. But you just got to make those decisions wisely and, you know, choose how, you know, you, you exercise this new guideline and um, right that we have. So. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Petey. And we're going to close this question. With Dr. L well, I'm speaking it, Lapetria. Um, and I know that you had had done a survey, so you could share your thoughts. Um, you right. Yeah, I had to unmute myself. So um basically I did a survey. Um and the first question I asked was, do you agree with the CDC new guidelines? 31% said yes, 69% said no. Um, the second question that I asked, did you get vaccinated? 57% said yes, and 43% said no. So that's to me is a good, um, you know, a lot of, and you have 57% said yes, but definitely it's still a lot of pe people questioning the vac vaccination. Um, so we have 43 that said no. Um, and that's a large number um, that has not got vaccinated. Um, with the CDC new regulation, a lot of people um, are still in fear because some of us are not vaccinated. Um, 
And um, I just found out uh, from an article that was published in the CBS um, Austin, um, on an Austin article. Um, and basically, that's where the source came from. They basically mentioned that um, teens and adolescents um, after the after this during, after they get the second shot they are experiencing a rare heart condition and um parents are question questioning now um should they give their teens these shots um and what a doctor said dr shaw he said that um parents need to do a risk assessment a risk versus benefit assessment um, to get um, to get the shot. So before giving your child a shot, I think you need to find out the side effects. Um, basically, you know, what are some risk factors um, before deciding to get the shot or not? You know, a lot of people, um, um, a young young man was telling me that basically the reason why he don't get, he didn't get the shot is basically because I pass afraid of, um, you know, you know, the experiments they have done on black America. And he basically also mentioned um, his body. He don't usually get the flu shot because his body um, basically is, a you know, he, he basically get more sick off of the flu shot. Um, so it, it's many reasons um, why people, and of course with my polls, you know, we got 46% that's saying they haven't got it yet. Um, so that's that's the polls that I'm getting, the polls results. And it, it's actually, um, I put it out on my Facebook page and I have you know, over 3,000 um, friends. Okay. okay. All right. Well, um, you can say we have to use our own, as you say, common sense. Uh, Dr. Petey has stated the pandemic is not over. Um, with the vaccine, is saying um, that you are more protected than not protected. So it's, uh, it's like if you were, um, when HIV was a big thing, you know, you either go without or you, you know, at least try. It, Something might happen, but at least you tried to protect yourself. That's my take on it. Uh, and truly with it, uh, and I'm one, I'm I'm holistic. I love natural things. I love vitamins. I don't I don't like any type of medications. But um, for me, getting it uh, and to be able to love on my family and, and not be as concerned. It has been totally worth it for me. Um, and like I say, if you choose not to, just know know yourself and stay safe. Um, and so I wanna thank the get, I wanna thank y'all, LaPetria, counselor, Dr. Petey and Minister Tay. I thank y'all for joining me. I thank y'all for saying yes. And I appreciate y'all for joining me uh, this Testimony Tuesday. And I want to thank everyone that joined us through Cruise Radio, through um, Facebook, whatever means. If you're listening, I want to say thank you. We appreciate you. We love you. And you can always join me on my page every Tuesday, 7 o'clock, San Antonio time. That's Texas uh, for Testimony Tuesday. Next month, we'll be going back to the regular Testimony Tuesday. I began it because at this hour, people do need encouragement. A lot of times people feel alone, feel like they're going through something that no one else have been through. So God has blessed me to bring people on that have been through some stuff and they made it out. And if they made it out, you can too. All right. God bless you and good night. Anyone can be sued for a personal injury case if they are at fault. For instance, if you did something wrong and you are within the scope of your employment, that means you are doing the work of your employer and you wrecked. That causes you to be sued and your employer to be sued also. And oftentimes there is a dispute 
And that's when we have to get good consultants, we have to get good engineers, we get experts in that field to try to help us convince a judge or a jury. Also, we always scour the neighborhood to see who's outside, see if there are cameras on the street, see if anyone was in their yard and they, they actually saw this, to see if we could find some of those individuals because they're the eyewitnesses. They can help determine the facts of the case.